coordinated network and um, we, we, this is a, a launch of some meetings that we're going to be setting up to try and support people in the bundles um, delivery of the COPD and new asthma discharge bundle. Um, so if, can I have the next slide please? Great. So th this is our housekeeping. So um, I think you probably saw that we're actually recording this session so it could be circulated for people who aren't able to attend. If you can keep your microphone muted um, and it's quite helpful. I don't know if we, there's enough, so many people that we need to have the video off. Do we need that? No, we, we're okay with that. If you want to ask a question, you're all used to this now, put your hand up try and remember to put it down when you're asking the question or um, put a question into the, the chat function. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll have some stops in between the little sections and um, answer those if we haven't already. So rather than going around everyone um, attending, if you could introduce yourself by putting, um, it will show up your name, but put your, the, the site you work, because there's lots of, site, lots of sites now in big uber trusts and, and your role. Um, I'm going to introduce um, the core team. Uh, many of you will know Ellie. Uh, you will know her as Ellie Wells, but um, you may see her showing up as Ellie Mason now due to a recent event. So congratulations <laughs> on that. Um, Tom Myers, who is our, our dashboard and data guru. Uh, we've got Bav supporting us. And I particularly um, want to ask Sean to, to say hello. So, Sean, um, you, you tell people what you're up to. Hi, uh, I'm Sean Farron. So I'm the new program manager for the Adopt and Spread uh, work stream of the Patient Safety Collaborative. In effect, that means I'm taking over from Ellie on the KSS uh, bits of work around COPD and asthma, but Ellie will still very much be with us, both doing some national work and supporting us on our local work. Great. So um, uh, Sean's been doing a lot behind the scenes and you'll sort of see more and more of him. So we're going to uh, start off by um, attempting something brave. And um, what we want to do is get your get your um, thoughts, your reactions to the question, which is what lasting effect has COVID had on your service? I think I've got the question right there. I would encourage you to try and um, have positive and, and negative. Um, if it's all negative, that's fine. But if there's positives, put them in two. So a few words, just a few words on that. Now, Ellie's going to do the how it works, I think. Yes. Thank you, Joe. So if you just follow the link that um, Bab has put into the chat for the meeting, it should take you through to the um, Q&A question. If it doesn't, you can also join um, by, a, by your smartphone um, by scanning the QR code and entering that um, hashtag and uh, pin number there. If you have any problems at all with entering it into the slide, I do put it into the chat and, and Bab will put it in um, to the poll for you. We'll just give it a few minutes for everybody to have time um, to start commenting. We've already got the uh, mention of virtual clinics there, Joe. I know that's something you mentioned was a change for you and your team. As um, Ellie said, if it, if the Slido isn't working for you, um, it, you can put things into the chat, but it does seem to be working. Yeah. I got the link, OK, so that's good. So virtual clinics is really coming out as the strongest theme at the moment. Yeah, yeah. It's and I, I'm, I'm guessing that is possibly a positive rather than a, a, a negative. It may not be. 
stuff diverted is probably a negative. Yeah, we're seeing um, waits for routine outpatients and uh, deferred follow up. Yeah, MTT, I think um, working, working together, sort of building links and partnerships with teams that we hadn't worked with before. And, and that, that I think for me, that was a positive thing. Access to services, I guess that's saying um, difficult access to services may may be different. Um, and reduce GP access. Yeah, so burnout, that, that's a, it's, it's, uh, that's very difficult. In our trust, we've, there's been lots of well-being um, approaches, but I'm not, I'm not sure how much that, that really makes a difference in practice personally. Are we good? Yeah, I, th I think we'll um, leave that running in the background, Joe, and we can start some of the presentations and then come back to this at the end of the meeting. I, I, I'm guessing that, that, that a lot of that will resonance with, with uh, all our colleagues, actually. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. And that will continue to run throughout the meeting if there's anything anybody would like to add um, as we carry on. Um, so Sean's just going to share um, the slides in a moment and I'm just going to kick off with um, just updating you all around the National Patient Safety Programme and then I'm going to hand over to Jo who's going to talk a little bit about our position as a region um, pre-COVID. Um, so um, I, I know some of you are already familiar with the patient safety collaboratives, but I think it's just worth giving a little bit of an update um, as there have been some changes to the programme and the ambitions over the last year or so. Um, so just to say that the National Patient Safety Programme um, is a collection of 15 regional patient safety collaboratives and we're aligned to the um, AHSN footprints. Um, so we we as an AHSN have a patient safety collaborative team and the um, COPD and asthma discharge bundles are falling under that commission um, but we will continue to support that through our KSS respiratory collaborative so you'll continue to hear about um, the bundles at, at our events and through breathing matters and so on. Just to give a bit of background about the National Patient Safety um, Programme, it's the largest safety initiative in the history of the NHS and their um, aim is really to support um, the culture of safety and continuous improvement um, and also um, sustainable improvement as well. Um, the aim of the Adopt and Spread programme, which is the programme that the COPD and asthma bundles fall into, is to identify and support the adoption and spread of effective and safe evidence-based interventions and practice. And I think it's really worth us acknowledging as a region um, how we've all worked together on the COPD discharge bundle for some time. And it is actually our sort of collective experience and the improvement that we've made in, in Kent, Surrey and Sussex, which has been used um, as the model to form the COPD Discharge Bundle programme and also as of this year to include asthma as well. So I think that's something we should be really proud of as a region and I, I know asthma is um, you know, something new for us to support you with but we're really hoping that we can continu continue to support you with the relaunch of COPD and also um, with the inclusion of the new asthma work stream. Um, so we are the leading patient safety collaborative um, for COPD and asthma based on our experience. Um, so we're sharing our regional um, experience from sort of 2016 onwards and learning as a region with other patient safety collaboratives too. On the screen, there are the two, two ambitions for the um, COPD and asthma discharge bundles which are to increase the proportion of patients in acute hospitals receiving every element for which they're eligible of the BTS COPD discharge care bundle by uh, to 80% by March 2022. And it's the same aim for asthma as well with the additional um, time frame of March 2023. So, I think what I'd just like to say there is we know that that's a very high ambition and we're just really keen to support you all with that, but also to make sure that we are taking sustainable and realistic steps to getting back to that ambition. I think um, 
you know, we Joe's going to go through the data shortly where we were pre-COVID. And I think the advice we've been giving to other regions is to really aim to, to get back to where we were first before we really aim for that 80 percent. Um, so I, I'll hand over to you now, Joe, to talk through some of the data um, and then we'll pick up on some top tips later on. Thanks. If we could have the, the next slide, please, Sean. Great. So just as a reminder, because there has been a bit of a hiatus with the pandemic, um, that uh, th this is the history of how we were doing across Kent, Surrey, Sussex. So you will know the appropriate care score is the total percentage of patients reported who received all elements of the discharge bundle. And this goes um, from about 2015 to 2019. And you can see overall a steady, sustained increase and you can see a dip in February I think that's probably particularly bad winter I think when things are busier that the numbers although the number of patients increase the the percent getting the all the elements drops a little but 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 that sustained steady but even then we were only kind of touching 60 percent so you know that ambition of 80 percent didn't come from us but but it, what we're looking at is in, is in improving care so what did that result in next slide so what we saw over that time, we got a reduction of variation in, in, in the acute trust of, of length of stay. So there was quite a nearly four days difference in um, median length of stay between our app, you know, either end of the trusts. So um, a difference down, reduced variation in 30 day readmission rate and as well a da reduced downward trend in length of stay and a downward trend in inpatient mortality. Now I'm not saying all that is, is due to the discharge bundle but the outcomes are improving across the region. Next slide. And um, the, the, um, that sort of numbers on the right and what was happening in 2014. So although there were increased unscheduled admission by 2019, the number of bed days on the bottom line had reduced compared to 2014-15. Um, and, and bed days is a key thing in, in NHS statistics. And, and as I said before, KSS, I mean, I thought the mortality might go up because we, you know, we were keeping people at home and only admitting these severe people, but in fact, mortality went down. So it's partly kind of on the back of this work that, that the COPD bundle was taken up nationally by the, the um, Patient Safety Collaborative. Next slide. So, so where are we now? So people are still reporting into the system um, that, that the, we know that the um, number of admissions with acute exacerbation of COPD has fallen so that the number reported has fallen but what we, we what we also see is if we compare the number reported to the number recorded on on the HES system actually the proportion that we're reporting has also fallen so that's not surprising I mean you know for the things we mentioned at the beginning in the world word cloud uh, teams team working has been disrupted people have been redeployed um, so that's not surprising that that's where we want where we are so uh, um, case ascertainment that is how many of your exacerbate admissions with the exacerbation of COPD are you actually getting to reporting on it and to me that's a really important number um, so has anyone got any questions or, or comments about that We thought the slider would warm you up, but clearly not. <laughs> does that feel about right? Does that does that sort of seem to reflect where you are? You can type your answer. Oh, there's a thumbs up there from an anonymous person. OK, or oh, anything go you can put into the chat. Oh, another. I presume that's oh, Angela's going to start type something. You can you can say something. So I'm just saying that that reflects what 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 uh, uh, is going on in in the service, and are people keen to to kind of kind of get get this going again for their patients? Do we do we think this is the right thing we should be doing? Is really trying to re-establish the discharge bundles? That's a, a thumbs up from someone. <laughs> Any anyone anyone disagree? 
anyone does? Okay, there's a several yeses. Great. Okay. Okay. So that that sounds good. Okay. Good. Next next slide, please. Tuck says. Oh, Tuck's got a question. Great. Oh, hi, Joe. Um, I'm sure you'll come to this, but you know, we such a this um, um, disbandment of outpatient elective activity and lack of face to face consultations that also GPs can't do. Wonder if we're going to cover how we actually see or assess our patients, both asthma and COPD. So the bundle work is particularly um, centered around um, ac ac acute admissions. But but I think it also should link to community teams, and, and I think community teams are seeing people face to face um, when they need to. Um, in my trust, we're we're doing a mixture of face to face and virtual consultation. So if we feel we need to see someone, we we, we do. It's just that also with the NHS long term plan, the trajectory is forty percent virtual and sorry. 60% virtual and 40% non-virtual across all specialties. Um, yeah, I, the mantra is uh, virtual by default, isn't it? But I, I think what I'd say is do, do the right thing for the patient. For some patients, virtual is good and the right thing. But if, if you need to see them, I think we can see them safely now. That's what I've been doing. Um, okay. So um, now you will be familiar with with the KSS dashboard that we've been using that the slide shots are showed um, of that um, improving ACS came from there. Uh, but Tom's going to explain what's happening going forward. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, so I am Tom Mize. I have been working within our little respiratory team for a number of years at this point, and uh, a few of you will uh, remember me presenting the previous KSS dashboard um, when this was uh, a, a regionally focused program. So um, through discussions with NHSI, obviously this then became a national program. And so we needed to introduce a mechanism uh, in order to be able to access every trust data reliably. Um, because as some of you may remember, the, the local KSS approach resulted in you having to export your data to us via email. And that just was not sustainable uh, when we consider there's what 130 odd trusts across the country. And so what we went about doing was we put a data sharing agreement in place along with NHS Improvement and um, with HWIP, who ultimately are the funders of NACAP. And so what that allows us to do is on a monthly basis is receive every single patient who's been reported into the, uh, the NACAP audit and allows us to build the sort of data dashboards that you're quite familiar with, but for other regions uh, across the country. And so um, what we're seeing just on the uh, slide at the moment is just a, a very quick sort of demonstration of the latest COPD dashboard, um, which you are all able to gain access to should you wish to. Um, and this gets updated just on a monthly basis at trust level. Um, and what we know is that there are uh, varying um, levels of data literacy um, across um, the entire healthcare system. And so what we've tried to do is sort of provide a number of different views uh, to kind of make sure that it's accessible to all who want to have a um, uh, have a look at the data um, to see how your sort of discharge bundle adherence uh, looked previously and also how it's looking in the most recent months. Um, and as we can see on the chart here, we sort of provide a, a regional average, we provide a national average, and then you can filter down to your very specific trust to see how you compare against the two. Um, and we do that with sort of nice time series charts, or you can do the uh, the nice little uh, bar chart, comparative charts, where you can uh, select a specific uh, point in time and uh, see how you compare to the rest of the patch. And ever, as ever, we caveat this with what we don't want people to be feel like we are marking them for their delivery. This is all in order to try and help promote a uh, better discharge bundle delivery. Um, and so we hope that you're able to identify sort of well-performing trust within the patch and then potentially have a conversation with them 
uh, pinch any sort of nice little bit pieces of best practice that they have um, deployed within their trust to uh, improve uh, processes on discharge. So this is the, the asthma uh, and the COPD uh, dashboard. Sean, if we can just flick over to the next slide, please. So now that we've um, been given the asthma discharge bundle as a national piece of work as well, we need to, to provide a similar tool. And so I don't imagine that many on the call, uh, the call today will have seen uh, what's on the slide deck now. So unlike COPD, we haven't yet got ourselves into a position where we're able to probe the, the national um, audit to get frequent data cuts uh, every month. But we needed to understand what our baseline position was for asthma discharge bundle delivery uh, across KSS and the, the, the rest of England. Fortunately, um, earlier in 2021, the National Audit provided a 1920 data dump on data.gov which had every single trust and uh, their aggregated position for each of the discharge bundle measures. And so using that, what I was able to do was to turn it into a sort of high level dashboard here to allow um, providers across the country to understand what their asthma discharge bundle delivery looked like in 1920. Um, and so this dashboard at the moment is quite high level. It is full of a lot of bar charts so that you can compare your site with other sites and you can view each of the different discharge bundle elements for asthma and how they weigh up against the national average. Um, but because this was just like a one year data dump, which was just left on data.gov, unfortunately, we can't provide any sort of time series charts at the moment. Um, but we are definitely working with NHSI and HQIP already to be able to start providing this a more COPD style dashboard for asthma starting in September. Um, and we anticipate having very sort of very similar functionality in the asthma dashboard than we do to uh, the current COPD dashboard. Um, so both of these dashboards are accessible to anybody on the call and anybody who's listening um, to the recording. Uh, and Ellie's beating me to it. What we um, require is that you contact the data inbox that Ellie's just left the note in the chat for. Um, people who previously used the dashboard um, will discover that they can no longer access it. And this is because we've had a bit of an infrastructure change. And so we've had to move the location of the, the data and the dashboards are held. Um, and so you will just require to contact me if you want to regain access to any of the tools that we previously used. Um, but this is all quite simple and I can fire over a login and password to you as soon as you get in contact with the data inbox. Um, next slide, please, Sean. And I think again, and I think this is just please. So I know that says Tom Myers, but Eddie's quite right. If you can actually contact the data inbox um, if you wish to gain access and um, we can set you up quite quickly. Are there any questions at that point? Anything anyone wants to ask Tom? I know people have used the if if uh, people are wanting a bit more of a, a if we want to provide a bit more of a bespoke sort of how you navigate the dashboard, how you can interrogate it, what it's telling you, um, we have got recordings of uh, Ellie and I doing this, um, which we're happy to share. And if there are any trusts who are really interested in having a sort of bespoke one to one session to quickly go through the dashboard, I'm quite happy to um, facilitate that as well. Um, Angela. Um, hi Tom. Um, it, would we need to? Would is there any way uh, when the data comes over that we're able to identify um, to a degree with days of the week of admission, or is that work we need to do internally to look at what proportion of you know our admissions are over weekends, etc.? So that's not something which is in the dashboard. But if that's something of interest, then I'm more than happy to look into building a sort of report which reflects that. Um, more than happy to work with you on that. And if there are other trusts who are interested, then I'm more than happy to provide that yeah. to them as well. It's just perfect from a you know from an asthma perspective, you know, just thinking ahead and um making the case that we will need more resources if we've got predominantly more admissions at weekends for asthma and a much reduced length of stay. It's very hard for the you know for the specialist clinicians to get to them. So that's why I'd be looking for it. Thanks. Okay then. 
Um, so what I can do is I'll have a look at the data set on data.gov for asthma to see whether that information is held in there. If not, that will be something that we'll have to look at come September when we start getting access to the patient level data. Um, but I'll follow up with an email. It's, with a it's a really good point. I could see how that helps you make the case for, for more yeah. um, resource, Angela. Good point. Any other points or questions? Bethy has agree agreed as well. Yeah. So that, that, I think that's an ask there, Tom, for you. He loves a challenge. Yep. Brilliant. Okay, then. <laughs> anything, sure. else? anything else? Okay, so I think uh, uh, Tux agreed, yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, that's right. So I think now we're going to um, talk a little bit more about the asthma discharge care bundle, and and uh, you may be less familiar with this, you may not, but Sean's going to take you through this or us through that. Okay, thanks, Joe. I thought it might be useful just to go through some of the detail of um, what's in both the NACAP audit. Um, and what counts as uh, achieving the full bundle. So first of all, uh, a bundle is not just an informal kind of gathering of interventions. It, it's a defined list of things that should be done for every patient. And that list might be paper or ele electronic. I know some people use stickers and some people just have a uh, alert on the notes. Um, and from our perspective, if all six elements of good practice, which I'll go through in a moment, are not delivered, then the care bundle has only been in incompletely applied. So we're looking at the full six. And they are. Uh, so the inhaler technique has to be checked. And the, the stuff in the small text here is the guidance that's given as part of the audit um, and part of our indicators. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward about checking and reviewing somebody's inhaler technique. Uh, and also reviewing people's maintenance medication. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you should also use the admission as a, an opportunity to review people's self-management um, and review the reasons behind their attack and possible actions to prevent uh, future uh, severe asthma attacks. So they're fairly straightforward interventions. Then there comes the personalised asthma action plan. Uh, so if somebody's obviously got a plan, obviously uh, it's about reviewing that and, and not just assuming it's all up to date and correct. But if people don't already have a plan, uh, they really need to receive a personalised action plan. Uh, and we've highlighted there, this is really key because nobody should leave hospital without a written personalised asthma action plan. Number five is about tobacco dependency. And obviously this is greyed out if somebody's already been identified as a non-smoker, a non-vapor. And we've included the detail there because the audit really does include quite a lot of guidance on on where to categorize people according to uh, how recently they've smoked or if they've been a vapor i won't go through all of those but it's, it's on the web tool and then like copd uh, the final element is about requesting follow-up so community follow-up requested within two working days and specialist review within four weeks and again, there's some guidance about what that means in terms of ticking the box. So they're the key, the kind of six elements that need to be included uh, to be counted as a complete bundle. I thought it might be helpful just to point out that in 1920, so pre-COVID, the last national audit showed that actually personalised asthma action plans and community follow-up were the least frequently provided elements. Of, of good practice. The most frequently ones were um, in checking inhaler technique, reviewing medication and tobacco dependency. And I've looked at the data we've got for KSS and actually the, the trusts in our patch follow that trend as well. I've also included a slide just on, on the best practice tariff. So like COPD, there's a best practice tariff for asthma. And of course, I realise most trusts at the moment are on block contracts, but my understanding of next year is NHS England are looking at a combination of some block contracts funding, but including what they're calling incentive aligned funding uh, and best practice tariffs will fall into that incentive aligned funding box. Uh, given there's a best practice tariff for asthma, it might be helpful for people internally. I know in the past we've helped people build a case um, for additional funding, uh, 
to be able to demonstrate, for example, that achieving the best practice tariff requirements can fund additional service developments uh, and, and can become self-funding. So the key points to remember about that, it's about reviewing somebody within 24 hours of arrival and then providing these three elements of good practice as, as the discharge bundle. So that's it in terms of what the uh, definition of good practice for asthma is. I don't know whether anybody has any questions or comments about that before we move on. Oh, best practice tariffs. So as I said, at the moment, all tariffs are suspended uh, because of COVID. Trusts are still on block contracts. But from next April, the current plan for NHS England is from next April, they'll have what they're calling a blended funding model, which will include some block funding and some uh, incentive aligned funding. That may change, of course, but but that's the plan. Absolutely. Yeah. And Andrea. Yeah, hi. Um, I was. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yep. We can hear yeah. Well. Okay. Um, I was just wondering what everyone's experiences was about the um community follow up within two days. I'm surprised it's as high as forty percent. I don't think that's our experience here. And actually, organising follow up from the surgeries within two days of discharge is really difficult. I just wonder how other people are yeah. are getting around that or. So uh, if I could start off and then other people say what they think, but uh, I think that is a, a real challenge um, practically. However, it, as Sean put up, it's actually just requesting that follow up that counts on the audit. So it says communication directly, sending a fax who uses those these days or an email. So so it's actually requesting the follow up so that I guess that's why. It's, but but of course, what we what's important is whether it's happened or not. I, two days but and what might happen is what's happened before with the audit they start off with something that's relatively straightforward to achieve and then make it a bit harder and that may be what's happening but any other thoughts has anyone achieved that Sarah Pierce said very difficult to uh, organize Shankers put it can be a virtual call do, do you want to tell us a, a bit more what you do No, we don't have any for asthma, Joe, but I think I'm just thinking if it's a weekend or, you know, it's very difficult to arrange. I agree with what, um, um, you know, sorry, I didn't catch your name, what you said. Andrea. It's very, yeah, Andrea, yeah. So it's very difficult and who is going to be picking up and, you know, who's coordinating, especially weekend is difficult, yeah. I mean, certainly for COPD in Brighton and Hove, we do have a 48 hour community team, which is seven days a week, and they will make a call within 48 hours of discharge for the COPD. Um, so that th there are, but asthma is, is much more difficult because it often won't be under the community team. So Tuck, I know you put a question in, but you've got your hand up, so, so do speak. Uh, hi, um, I just wonder because if you borrow from some of the cancer uh, work, there is a um, most trusts have incorporated a sort of um, alert system when someone comes in, even if it's just through A and E, and whether that may be, you know, just being able to have a flag um, on your EPR that says this person's just flagged up in your trust. Uh, and I wonder if there may be some support from commissioners to help with that, because I agree it's very difficult to do it seven days a week, 24-7. Certainly an IT solution it would it must be the way forward. Uh, I don't know how many people have got electronic prescribing, but I've seen before is a prescription for prednisone 30 milligrams a day for five days minimum or something which, you know, People with asthma and COPD would get there won't be many other conditions would get that prescription as it can flag an alert so that's one way it can be done uh, any other thoughts about this and then we'll so your your hand's still up Andrew did you want to say something else are you going to take it down okay so Tuck's put in the smoking cessation brief advice or signposting and as far as I found, it, it isn't explicit. Does anyone know any better in the audit? Does the tobacco dependency addressed 
and I thought my looking through I didn't find any specifics on that anyone know any better maybe that's something we can take to the the national team Sean yeah I mean I think before it's it's about more than sort of being counting it's it's it's, it's doing the right thing is the, it's the important thing isn't it so it's not a, a tick box oh you smoked it it's but making some intervention and it do, seems like they're not proscriptive about what that is at this point in time but maybe that's something we can ask because i think the asthma NACAP uh web tool has put a bit more detail in than the copd did about um hints of like this the list of what counts as a smoker um so if you're only vaping you've never smoked you still count as a smoker for example um so it's been more helpful about 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 that so they i'm sure would be receptive to putting in some more guidance any anything else on that okay so next sean's going to tell us about the national patent data opt-out okay may or may not know about Thanks, Joe. Yeah, we just wanted to include something about this today because this is something that none of us were aware of actually until we we looked into it just recently. Um, and I need to just be clear that this is not the same as the primary care data opt out, which people may have heard has, has actually been indefinitely suspended. This is actually a policy that was in, introduced in 2018, uh, and it means all patients in secondary care can opt out of the, the use of their data for research or planning purposes. Um, and that basically means that because the NACAP audit is counted as research or planning purposes, if somebody has opted out in this way, we cannot include them in the audit. Uh, and organisations have to comply with this by the end of September. I think it was originally due to be implemented uh, in April 2020, but it's been delayed because of the pandemic. Um, so this is quite important. It could result in quite a lot of people opting out of the audit, uh, which would mean the data is uh, less valid th than it was. Uh, and there's a process for doing this. So I've just included this because I know different trusts have different ways of filling in the audit and different people do it. But you may want to look into uh, the process within your trust and make sure this is being applied to applied properly. Uh, so the the Individual patient data is supposed to go through this system called the MeSH system, and that means that you you submit everybody's NHS number, uh, and they send you a list back, a partial list, and all the the numbers of the people who've opted out have been taken off the list, and you have to do that before you do any processing with it at all for research or planning. So you can't do the audit and then remove people. You have to do this before you put them through the audit, and that can be quite logistically difficult, I imagine. Um, so trusts ought to be thinking about their plans because it's not just this audit. There will be lots of other processes they go through um, that this will apply to it's going to add an extra step to the process. And my understanding is that this mesh system has a little bit of a backlog. So actually you can wait a month or so before your data comes back with the opted out people removed, which obviously then delays the data even further. Um, so we're kind of just urging people to look into this within their own trust, make sure people are aware of it, make sure processes have been built in because we don't want to get to the end of September and then just find everybody's got their hands up in the air. So we, we're not sure what to do about this now. I've put some websites in there just for further information. So NHS Digital has got lots and lots of information about the opt out and how to uh, implement it. E-Learning for Health has actually got some e-modules on how to apply it. Uh, and there's all sorts of guidance, both for individuals, for patients and for health and care staff. So I thought it was just worth kind of sense checking whether people had any idea at all that this was on the cards or whether they know their trusts are on top of it and doing something about it, or whether it's just come out of the blue like it has for us. Yeah, so I see uh, Berthia's comment about the, uh, the list should be the other way around. Yeah, I mean, logic doesn't always enter into th these processes, does it? Uh, I can understand why um, people don't want their data included at all, and that's why the first thing you have to do is submit it. Um, it may be, for example, we 
we want to implement some system where we just note the number of people that we submit and the, the number that come back, because I'm not sure it will be obvious from the data how many people have opted out. I think uh, Nick had his hand up and then and Bethia. Nick, hi. Hi, hi. Uh, just quick, I haven't read it. I didn't know about this and I hadn't. Oh, if you didn't know about paper. it, Nick. No. <laughs> well, no. I just wondered if you had any insight into exactly what mechanisms secondary care trusts are meant to be implementing in theory to achieve this because I, it's not going to be clinical and I, I i suspect they don't know or there's no action happened at our end anyway okay uh, so because it and I, and I suppose the second question was even if the data is anonymized or do, will you have a sense of the numbers of people who have chosen to exclude so you know how biased or otherwise you're audit data will be at the end of it because if you know 50 percent of people of of your potential participants don't include then you can you know it's sort of garbage in garbage out isn't it mm -hmm. it probably won't be that much but it, you sort of need a sense of the proportion of people who've chosen not to submit their data but yeah so i'll just take isn't. i'll just take each of those in turn mm -hmm. so the process um I mean, I only know the headlines because thankfully it's not something I have to do personally, but the, the process is about using this mesh system. So the messaging exchange for social care and health, which is a, an NHS digital system um, and that's centralized. So every trust in the country will have to use that same system uh, and that will apply to all sorts of different audits and research projects that are going on. Um, I would hope there would be somebody in every trust that knows about this, whether that's in terms of the clinical audit department or something like that. But, you know, we don't know that. Um, I guess that would be the first step is to contact the, the audit department. And yeah. Because and, and, they may have it sorted. You never know. Yep. Then. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, it has been on the card since um, 2018, so it's not new, but obviously people have had a lot of other things to think about. Over yeah, the I imagine it will get done at a very high level once and in perpetuity so that, you know, if someone's opted out once, that's it, that, you know, they have to walk back in again, I, I imagine, for anything related to their data, whether it's audit of any audits or do you think that's the case? Not a one off thing. Well, that's certainly been part of the issue with the primary care opt out. Um, that the, the proposal was that it wouldn't work retrospectively. Um, and I think GPs are quite keen that it should. Just in terms of your second question about anonymised data. So anonymised data won't be in scope for this. This is only about patient identifiable data. One of the problems with the NACAP audit is that it is identifiable because you're putting NHS numbers in and date of admission mm. and things like that. Um, I think in terms of, I mean, you mentioned percentage, the best, ed, and it's, I think it's an educated guess nationally based on other similar schemes, is that we'll have a maximum of 5% opting out. Okay. So. Uh, but, you know, we won't know that for sure until, until it's fully operational. Yeah. I suspect most people won't know you can, I, you know, it's just. Yes. Well, no, yes, quite. It's probably, diff <laughs> probably quite difficult to do it as a patient, isn't it? And no one's going to tell you. Yeah, so just yeah, anecdotally. From from some of the work that we've been doing earlier and nationally, I think the, the the figure we've heard bandied about at the moment is about five percent of patients have opted out. Um, whether that increases or not, um, as this goes live, who knows? Um, there are some useful um resources on the NHS digital website, um, and I can see that Sean's got a few of them there. Uh, I know such as um University of Plymouth have developed a a little app which runs over the top of their systems so that. Uh, their audit team can frequently add NHS numbers to it and then staff are able to log on to double check whether those patients have opted in or out as opposed to having to submit a list uh, themselves. Um, so audit teams may have little ways of getting about this. Um, and then just anecdotally, obviously, because obviously we're quite keen uh, with uh, discussing respiratory, I've heard that the National Audit are also looking to build a tool um, so that they can filter out any patients which may slip the net uh, and they end up receiving that they should not necessarily have received. So I think all the different parties are just trying to be as safe as possible. Okay, Bethia, did you want to? Yeah, you've got your hand up. Well, yeah, yes, I, I, I agree with um, I agree with everything that's been said, but but how does the whole process of opting out get there? I mean, why can't we kind of be with the same as primary care and that and that sort of put across why does it have to be a separate opting out for secondary care and 
and also it, we should have a list of those who've opted out because then we can we know who doesn't want to be included it's too late the other way around isn't it should we put you in touch with nh <laughs> yeah. i know I oh, know. I'm sorry. I'll shut up. No, but um, no, no, do you know what I mean? Those are very real issues for us, as, as so Angela think, Scott said. And you, so I think they're things that we can sort of take back up to the the national team and yeah. the national lead and and make these points. And it sounds as though Brilliant. the audit is working on a solution anyway. Great. Uh, but it's just something. I think it's worth at this point talking to your audit lead or someone in your audit department and just see if there's a is there is a solution in your trust or not. Mm. and 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 mm. it, it. but <laughs> okay. if, if the answer's no then we know but yeah. that's the first okay. step isn't it so it'd be yeah. you know plymouth have got it sorted was it plymouth or portsmouth plymouth i think brilliant okay thank you right okay next what okay so we thought it was worth just kind of ending the presentations today thinking about how we can help as a network obviously for the last year or so people's attention has been elsewhere and, and this work stream hasn't been that active in this area so we've kind of just thought about the kind of things we've been involved with and the kind of things we do um, and just try to present that uh, pictorially uh, on this slide and really this is focused around these three kind of uh, blue balloons uh, around data us as a team and the network itself. Uh, and really, I won't go through every single one of these items, but part of the reason for having the dashboard and using it in the way we do is A, to highlight issues that are common for everybody so that we can feed that back and understand that something isn't working, but also to highlight outliers. So if you're struggling with a particular area, we can help you understand whether that's the same for everybody else or whether you've got a particular problem that other people don't have. And then we can work with you to try and understand why that is and what process issues uh, might have contributed to that. We can also help you measure um, the impact of any changes that you want to introduce. So, you know, if you do identify a problem and you do go through some quality improvement program locally, we can help you demonstrate whether that's working or not. We, as um, Joe alluded to there, we do have access to both the national audit team um, and the national policy team, and we can influence them to some extent, particularly if we have a fairly unanimous view from our network. We also talk to all the other patient safety collaboratives across the country, um, and we can compare views that are expressed here with the views they're hearing. So, you know, if most of the patient safety collaboratives are hearing the same feedback from their clinicians uh, and the trusts in their patch, we can feed that back as a very, very strong voice uh, and, a, and a lever for change if needed. We have access to all sorts of quality improvement resources within the Patient Safety Collaborative and we're hosted by the AHSN, so we uh, kind of have access to even more resources there. So as I say, we can support people in uh, doing local quality improvement work uh, and, and maybe uh, give access to some resources for that. Um, we could test solutions to problems. The network is all about collaboration and sharing. So as well as um, highlighting good practice uh, where somebody's doing something really good, it, it's a really good speaker for amplifying concerns, as I say, that we can feed back. So that was just a quick run through of reminding you that we're here. As somebody said earlier on, it's not our job to performance manage you. Uh, in fact, we are performance managed on how well you're doing. So it's really our job to support you to achieve this uh, and, and we'll help you in all these ways we can. And then just finally, I'm just going to hand back to Ellie just to go through some top tips. Thank you, Sean. Um, sorry, my connection seems to be a little bit dodgy, so I hope you can hear me OK. Um, I, I think you've actually covered a lot of this, Sean, in our um, in your um, summary there, but I just wanted to share this slide because it's something that Tom and I have been sharing with other regional networks um, based on our experience here in KSS. So as Tom and um, uh, Sean and Joe have all mentioned throughout the meeting, we really do use data as the centre to this work. Work. So I think it's just a reminder really that we are here to support you with data and to help you consider your process. You know, is there anything in your data once you've had the chance to look at the dashboard that you feel doesn't accurately reflect um, discharge bundle delivery or the care that you're providing as a team? If you come across any um, data entry or interpretation issues, please do raise those with us because we do work really closely with the National Audit. 
So we're always, um, you know, providing continuous feedback around the web tool and ways to make it easier to input data. Use the dashboard as a tool to demonstrate current working, particularly uh, in the current COVID climate. You know, it can be a really useful tool to facilitate open discussion and just um, really understand where your strengths are and um, which good practice care points are perhaps not as well delivered in your organisation. As Jo um, mentioned earlier, we, we are advising uh, teams to use the 1920 pre-COVID data as an initial baseline just because of the um, various uh, issues mentioned around um, less patient entries into the audit at, at the current time and a reduce in exacerbations and admissions. Um, we've touched on sustainability and demonstrating impact already, but again, let us know if there's anything we can do to, to support you to be able to share um, what the dashboard is telling you about your organisation. If there's anything that we can do to support um, with graphs, etc. and understanding the dashboard, we're very happy to. Um, and finally, just around our um, network, we're really lucky in KSS to have an established respiratory network already with you all as members. So this is perhaps um, more familiar to us as a region, but to say we are here as a community and do let us know if there's anything, um, you know, that you'd want to share with the network. We're really hoping as these bundle meetings progress, we're able to have a bit more open discussion and share what's going well for teams, but also to help you understand any issues that you're having at the moment. Um, also, let us know if there's anything that you're missing to support care um, and also support bundle delivery. If we don't have the answers as a region, as Sean said, we do have access to the wider patient safety collaborative network. So it may be that uh, another region will have tools that they can share with us or we can look to co-create tools as a network. And um, so that's just a quick summary, really, to say thank you all for um, you know, joining the meetings and we're really looking forward to working with you more closely again as we begin to start to focus on the bundles again. Um, I think I'm handing over to you now, Joe, to close yeah. the meeting. Yeah, and I'm quite keen to close like five minutes before at least so we, we have a little breathing space for people. Um, so um, mainly how often would you think this meetings would be helpful? Um, maybe put it in the chat, chat every two months, three months, whatever. Um, and any ideas for content of the meetings, um, I thought might be good to hear from particular, you know, trust a little case history about how, how things are on the ground for them or th things that have gone well or going well, things not so well. That was one idea. But any any um, ideas we will take up. Any, so any other comments someone's Type and just typing three monthlies, Andrea. I don't know if we had any ideas. We think we thought. <laughs> Did you? Any other comments, questions? Shankar says three monthly. Oh, have we got the I word think cloud again? About... Yeah, have we got the word cloud? Did it change or not? I think Bab's just going to share her screen. So two positives and two negatives in the in the in the um, large lettering. So there we are. OK, so three month thing seems to be what everyone's saying. Um, don't know that that sounds right. And um, I'll just let this message that's coming in and then let let finish at five two but okay thank you for me thank you all for joining and take care and look after yourselves try and get a holiday